This is the 14th installment of these short episodes where we just talk about a single topic, single technical topic, and today we're talking about the voltage drop measurement tool. And before we do that, I want to mention our excellent sponsors, Carrier, carrier Carrier.com, Mitsubishi Electric Cooling and Heating, the UEI Hubs Market with their high-quality induct thermohygrometers as well as temperature clamps and refrigerant probes all in one nice kit. If you look at the Hub 6, the WRS Connected Scales from UEI, those are the scales that I prefer. Refrigeration Technologies at refrigtech.com, some of the best-made American chemicals for the HVAC industry. Check out Refrigeration Technologies at RefrigeTech.com. Aeroasis, makers of the bipolar and nano air purifiers, the air purification products that we use at Kalo Services. And then finally, BizPal.org. If you're looking for a technician, then talk to Patrick over at BizPal.org and see if he can help you find your next technician for your company. All right, here we go. So a voltage drop tool. It's just a voltmeter, people. It's just a voltmeter. The way that I'm teaching voltmeters now and how they're used is to use it to check for a voltage drop. And that seems really counterintuitive because what do most people do with a voltmeter? They're checking across the line. So they check L1 to L2. Well, there's no voltage drop, they think, to themselves. But in fact, every time that you are measuring voltage, you are measuring a voltage drop. You are measuring a potential difference, true, but you are measuring a voltage drop between those two points. And so you have to have one higher and one lower. And so a way to think about that is a voltage drop. What do we say? Why is that important? Why does that matter? Well, it helps clear up some confusion. So give a common example. This will be sort of the prime example we use here in this episode, at least, although there are many. If you have a contactor where the contact points are beginning to add some resistance to the circuit, so they're not making good connection, you could disconnect power, energize the contactor coil and ohm across it, But that's not really under real conditions. That's not under the real temperature conditions at which that contactor is normally operating. And so to really see if that contactor is potentially causing a problem, if that pitting or that carbon buildup is potentially causing a problem, you can measure across those contact points. So imagine if you're looking at a contactor. So just pick one side. So say the right side and you've got contact points. We would normally read from bottom to bottom and top to top. But a really good test to do is to just measure across the contacts with voltage, with your voltmeter. And if you see anything on your meter, that equals your voltage drop. So whatever you measure on your meter equals your voltage drop between those two points. When you're doing something like measuring voltage drops on series circuits where you have loads in series, that comes in really handy because there are different voltages applied to each load depending on the number of loads and the ohms of each load. That's sort of school stuff, stuff that you do that math in school and then you forget about it. But in real life, we don't deal much with series circuits in air conditioning, at least. In electronics, you see it. But in air conditioning, we don't have much in the way of series circuits, at least unintentionally. But we do have unintentional series circuits quite often. And an example of an unintentional series circuit is switch gear or wiring that's adding more resistance than it should. And when it does add more resistance, then you're going to see a voltage drop across it. So using your meter on an energized load and measuring across switches on the volt scale, looking for a voltage drop is a very effective way of finding resistance in a circuit, but then also to find an open circuit. So you may or may not know this, but a really good way to use a voltmeter is to measure through a circuit. So you're going to be measuring from one side of the circuit to the other and kind of walking your way through. And then all of a sudden you'll see where you no longer have voltage. That's a typical way people will use it. I see where the voltage disappears. You keep your one lead pegged to ground or to neutral, should normally be neutral or the other side of power. And then you kind of walk your way through the circuit. But another really good thing to do with a switch that you know has potential applied to it is to measure across it. And if you measure across it and you don't have any voltage, that means that you have no voltage drop, which means the switch is closed and in good connection. Now, again, this only works if you know that there is potential applied to the switch. So it doesn't work, obviously, on a circuit that has no potential in the first place. But once you've established that the circuit has potential voltage on it, then when you measure across a switch that is closed, you will read nothing. And when you read across a switch that is open, then you will read generally. There are some additional caveats to that, but that's sort of the general idea. And why is that? Well, because an open circuit has voltage drop, right? You have a voltage drop across that air gap in the switch. When a switch is open, you're going to have voltage drop across that open switch. 
And so there's some other examples too. Like if you've seen the crankcase heaters that actually feed, backfeed through the compressor windings, that's another example of where we actually see a series circuit, a true series circuit, where that crankcase heater is wired in across the open contacts, so from top to bottom on one set of contacts. And what happens is that when the switch is open, the voltage is allowed to feed through that crankcase heater and then through the compressor winding back to the other side. If you've never seen this before, it's going to be hard for you to imagine this. But what you'll notice is that the current on that circuit is very low. It's just like a trickle charge. Why is that? Well, it's because you have cumulative voltage drops. You have a voltage drop across the crankcase heater, and then you have a voltage drop across the compressor windings. So there's a uh, law for this, and it's probably not something you're going to remember, but it is considered to be a pretty fundamental law of circuits. And there's a couple of them, but there's called Kirchhoff's Voltage Law or Kirchhoff's Second Law. It's a guy named Gustav Kirchhoff made this law. And this is sort of technical lingo, and I'll break it down a little more simply. But the law states that for a closed loop series path, so for a complete loop, a complete circuit, the algebraic sum of all the voltages around any closed loop in a circuit is equal to zero. So another way of saying that is, is that across the entire circuit, you're going to read the entire applied voltage because you have voltage drop across that entire circuit. A lot of guys, I think, get confused sometimes because you'll notice with your voltmeter that when you measure from one side of a load to the other side of a load, like a contactor coil, for example, you'll read the voltage. So let's say 27 volts, whatever. So you'll read 27 volts across that coil. But then you'll also read 27 volts across an open switch, and you'll also read it right at the transformer. And why is that? And I think a lot of people think, why is the load the same as an open? Well, they're similar in that almost all of the resistance in a properly constructed Y circuit, so if you're thinking of the low voltage Y circuit that powers your contactor coil, almost all of the resistance should be in that contactor coil. And so because almost all of the resistance is in that contactor coil, you're going to measure almost all of the voltage drop across that contactor coil. Now, the wires have a little bit of resistance, and you'll have a little tiny bit of resistance in the contact points inside the thermostat. But in general, the resistance in that circuit is in that contactor coil, which is why you read the full applied voltage, right? Now, imagine for a second that you had a wire that was feeding that contactor that had some additional resistance in it. It was who knows what. Something was wrong with it. And so you had some additional resistance in that wire, had a bad connection, whatever. Now you wouldn't read the full applied voltage at that contactor under load. You would read less than the applied voltage because that additional resistance is going to take up some of that voltage drop. So if you could kind of imagine, if you're thinking of a series circuit, so you're going from one side to another in a 24 volt circuit, just for imagination's sake. And if 100% of all of the resistance is in that contactor coil on this 24 volt circuit. We're going to say it's exactly 24 volts. If 100% of the resistance is in that contactor coil, then when you measure across that contractor coil, you're going to read 24 volts. But say for instance, that the wire feeding it has a voltage drop of 2% of the overall circuit resistance. Well, then 2% of the voltage drop is going to be in the wire, and then you're going to read 98% of the voltage drop across that contactor coil. So remember, the point of this podcast is to get you to start thinking of a voltmeter. Think of it as a voltage drop tool, that you're using your voltmeter. You have those two leads in your hands, and what you're doing with those two leads is you're looking for voltage drops. And so you're going to see a voltage drop across open circuits if there's a potential difference between those two points. You're going to see a voltage drop across a load, naturally, but you're also going to find other voltage drops that may be undesigned voltage drops. Now, keep in mind, a voltmeter is most effective in this purpose when it's used under load, because when you have an open circuit where there's no electrons moving, well, then you're always going to read the full applied voltage. I use the example of, imagine that you wired up a compressor, but instead of wiring it up properly, you wired it up with thermostat wire. So instead of using proper number 10 wire, number 8 wire to wire up the compressor, you're using thermostat wire, all right? So when you have this thermostat wire, what will happen when the circuit is open, think of running thermostat wire to the disconnect for the condenser, for example. When you have the disconnect pulled and you measure the voltage at that disconnect, you're going to measure the full applied voltage. You're going to measure the full voltage drop of, say, 240 volts, for example, feeding this condenser disconnect. So in our imagination right now, let's just set our imagination up. You literally wired the wires to a disconnect for a condenser with thermostat wire, and you have the disconnect pulled. And you're measuring the voltage between those two, the L1 and L2, little number 18 wire or whatever, number 20 wire. 
and you're going to measure 240 volts there because you have that full voltage drop across the line there and it's not under any load. Now, as soon as you apply a load to it, as soon as you push that disconnect in, your voltage is going to drop down to nearly nothing. Why? It's going to drop down to nearly nothing because of the voltage drop across that wire. You're going to have a huge voltage drop at amperage. And so as you put that thing under load, there's going to be an enormous voltage drop on those conductors, and you're going to measure that across those two lines there. Because when it's not under load, you can't really measure and see what your voltage drop is going to be. So anyway, voltage drop an application works best when it is under load, but you also will see a voltage drop when it isn't open because, of course, in open circuit, there's no path whatsoever. So, of course, you're going to read the full voltage drop. All right, that's it. So, what you can take away from that is if you want to sound fancy, Kirchhoff's second law. You can quote Kirchhoff's second law if you'd like. And for a closed loop series circuit, the algebraic sum of all the voltages around the closed loop in a circuit is equal to zero. In other words, the voltage drop across the entire circuit is equal to the resistances in the circuit. So the additive effect of all of those resistances. And so if you want to calculate the voltage drop, you can do that mathematically, but we don't care about that. Generally, we're not usually sitting there with our calculator doing math with voltage drops out in the field, unless we're calculating allowable voltage drops. And I'll give you another little quick takeaway, something you can take home with you. You generally only want to see about a 5% voltage drop in total. So when you have a 247 volts applied at the panel mains coming in, you only want to see a maximum of 5% voltage drop under load, not during start. During start, your voltage drop will be a little higher because you have that really high amperage during the start of a compressor. But on a running appliance, you only want to see about a 5% voltage drop from start to finish. So from where it comes in on the main into the panel to where it hits your appliance. So there you go. Think of your voltmeter as a voltage drop tool and see how that works for you. I'm sure some of you are going to be like, that's way too confusing. And maybe it is, but I've been thinking about it that way lately and it's made a lot more sense. All right. We'll talk to you next time on the HVAC School Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>